Hello Brain Nerds, my name is Jason, welcome to the Big Brain Busters. So in this video we are going to discuss a free living parasite known as Negleria fowleri, of which we are going to discuss its morphology, life cycle, pathogenesis, diagnosis and treatment. And as usual at the end of the video I have put up some practice questions to allow you to test your memory and see whether you've understood. With that being said, let's jump into it. Now, before we actually jump into Negleria fowleri itself, let's talk about the free-living amoeba in general, which are also known as amphizoic amoeba. The term amphizoic is used to describe uh, organisms that are able to live in both the body of the host and in a free-living state. And this is known as endozoic and exoic. So these free-living amoeba or amphizoic amoeba are both endozoic and exoic and there are three known free living pathogenic amoeba of which we have the Negleria fowleri, Acanth amoeba species and Balamonthia mandrillaris. So for this video we are going to focus more on Negleria fowleri because that's where we're going to focus much on. Then in the next videos we are going to look at these other two amoeba. So to introduce this dude into the game, we would describe him as he is a protozoan single cell parasite who belongs to the phylum Pecolozoa. And it is the only species in the genus Negleria known to infect humans. Okay, And uh, it is known to cause a disease that is known as primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, abbreviated as PAM. And for that reason, that is why it is called a brain-eating amoeba. Now, where is it found? Negleria fowleri is mainly found, or in short, it survives in warm fresh waters such as lakes, rivers, hot springs, and also in soil. Then it is thermophilic. I guess that's why he feels himself to be hot because he can survive in hot temperatures up to 45 degrees Celsius and um, known to invade meninges. That is why it is restricted to um, the central nervous system, the throat, and you know, invades the human body via the nasal cavity, of which we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, in time after we, yeah, like when we start describing its uh, pathogenesis and the life cycle. Then it is also known to be aerobic, meaning that it thrives in oxygen-rich conditions. Now let's talk about the morphology of Neglea fowleri. It exists in three forms, which is the cystic form, the trophozoid form, also known as the amoeboid form, and the flagellate form. This stage, the flagellate is transient, okay? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, so now let's kick it in by talking about the cyst form of Neglea fowleri. It has a round structure, measures about 7 to 15 micrometer in diameter. It is made up of um, heavy double layered cyst wall and it has a single nucleus. Okay, so that's the single nucleus there, and these are the labels. Then it is also made up of a few granules, of which, in comparison to the trop trophozoid form, these are the food vacuoles. And these food vacuoles appear empty in the cyst form as compared to the trophozoid form. Okay. Then uh, that's the level for the cyst walls. Then it is non-motile, okay, meaning that does not um, move, right? Then it is resistant. So in this case, when it when this uh, nuclear fowlery has been uh, exposed to unfavorable conditions, you find that it becomes resistant to that by f uh, converting into cyst form, okay. Okay, now let's talk about the trophozoid form of Neglea fowleri. This it measures about seven to twenty micrometers, and it is the infectious stage and reproductive stage. It contains a structure known as a food cup or amoebostome, which is used to engulf food substances, or uh, such as white blood cells. And how this food cup is formed? Whenever this trophozoid form senses any nearby food, it goes there, and then its ectoplasm forms a pseudopodia around that food, of which that would be now known as the food cup which engulfs that food and takes it to store to be stored in vacuoles known as food vacuoles then it is broad anteriorly as you can see broad anteriorly and then narrow posteriorly like that and then at the end it tapers to a um, substance known as a uroid structure so this yellow substance here is the uroid structure which aids in locomotion 
then it divides via binary fusion fission sorry and uh, via process known as promitosis which is a sub form of mitosis but then it is unregulated okay so these are some of the notes it contains pulsating vacuoles or contractile vacuoles so let me just put some labels so that you can see so this is lobopodia so this lobopodia is the is formed by the ectoplasm which is the pseudopodia and this pseudopodia it aids in movement and then it contains food vacuoles where food is stored it contains the nucleus this nucleus here with a centrally located endosome then it has this uroid process which also aids in movement and then it contains pulsating vacuoles which aid in regulating osmotic pressure by contracting okay now let's talk about the flagellate form of neglea fowleri so this is the structure that we are going to be looking at right and this structure here is transient okay it contains two flagella on the broad anterior end so this is the broad anterior end and it contains two flagella so these flagella are readily shed and become it goes back to its amoeboid form or trophozoic form so why it is known as transient is because it can only persist for a short period of time and why that because when it has been administered or exposed to an favorable conditions that's when it can develop these two flagella so that it can move to other places where it can um, be suitably adapted then it is non-dividing so meaning that it is not reproductive and then it is also known as amoebo flagellate okay so that's it about the flagellate form okay so now let's talk about the life cycle of neglea fowleri record that the trophozoid stage is the infective stage of this guy Okay? And whenever there are changes in the environment, such as low nutrition, temperature changes, or pH changes, this amoeboid form will change to a biflagellated form to aid in movement to suitable places. But then when the conditions are too harsh, this amoeboid form will develop a cyst around it and then becomes insisted. insisted okay? So now let's say this dude goes on a good time swimming on a vacation and then swims in water bodies full of amoeboid forms of neglea fowleri what will happen is that these guys the trophozoites will enter into this guy's system via the nasal cavity and then through the nasal cavity to travel to the brain and then it will cause primary amoebic meningoencephalitis such that diagnostic stage of this guy you find that when you draw a sample of cerebrospinal fluid you will find a whole bunch of this amoeboid form in the csf all right and then occasionally you will find some biflagellated form the flagellate form of neglea fowleri but you won't find the cyst form of neglea fowleri in the cerebrospinal fluid during diagnosis okay okay now let's talk about the pathogenesis of neglea fowleri the problem starts when this individual has been exposed to water bodies that contain this parasite it enters the system via the nasal cavity by attaching to the olfactory nerve endings crosses the cribriform plate and enters into the brain cavity by attaching on the olfactory bulb via the glycoproteins and the certain proteins when it reaches the brain cavity it starts proliferating and eating the brain tissue this will result into recruitment of immune cells such as neutrophils, basophils, astrocytes, and microglia. And these immune cells will start releasing pro inflammatory cytokines, which will definitely lead to what? An intense inflammatory reaction. That will lead to increase in intracranial pressure, which may lead to symptoms such as vomiting and headache. Now, this recruitment of immune cells to the site of infection is like a trap because this trophozoid form will start eating up the immune cells themselves okay so it's like a trap and then apart from eating the host cell uh, cells it also has another pathogenic um, feature by releasing cytolytic enzymes such as phospholipases neuramidases phospholipolytic enzymes that also play a role in host cell and nerve destruction now this combination of pathogenicity and intense immune response can often result to death Secondary um, infection usually include cerebral infections and also they also extend to other organs such as the lungs, the spleen and the heart. 
Now, what are some of the characteristics that arise from the pathogenesis of primary amoebic meningoencephalitis? First of all, you have sinuses filled with exudates and amoeba. Secondly, you will have the brain being soft and they'll be filled with um, these amoeba in the gray matter. Then, apart from that, the meninges will be hyperemic and purulent, meaning that there'll be some, um, you know, hole filled up with pus. And then when you talk of the olfactory bulb, well, the olfactory bulb will be ulcerated and hemorrhagic, and it will also be necrotic. Then the spinal cord will also be necrotic. The gray matter of the brain will be filled with the amoeba. Okay, so now let's look at the diagnosis of primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, starting with clinical diagnosis, of which you would want to do some history taking, where you ask your patient of the history of swimming in stagnant or thermal water. And then one thing you should know is that from the day of um, exposure to the onset of symptoms, it takes about three to six days. Okay, now what are some of the clinical symptoms that you will see? There is some severe headache, stiff neck due to, you know, necrosed, um, spinal cord, then you would have seizures, fever, chills, coma, photophobia, confusion, and definitely death would result and also increased intracranial pressure. Now, what are some of the laboratory diagnoses that you would carry out? You would carry out some microscopy where you do a lumbar puncture, where you draw some CSF and do some staining, and then you would also want to carry out molecular techniques such as PCR, where you do some amplifying of amoeba DNA in the cerebrospinal fluid or tissues, then you would also want to use some serological techniques such as um, ELISA and also you would want to culture the CSF in the media covered with bacteria to provide food for the amoeba. Then also MRI for brain scanning to check out any abnormalities present in the brain. Okay, so now let's look at the treatment, prognosis, and prevention of primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. Well, you can use amphotericin B, where it is administered intravenously, intrathecally through the subarachnoid space, or intraventricularly. Then you can also use combination of sulfadiazine and amphotericin B. Then you can also use miltefazin as well to treat this guy. Then um, prognosis is usually fatal within seven days and survival depends upon early detection. Prevention is just usually just the opposite of how you can be exposed. So prevent contact with stagnant or thermal water and also adequate chlorination of public water supply. So as usual, we've added some practice questions to test your memory. So let's read together. Number one, describe the life cycle of Neglia Fowleri. Feel free to go back to the video and rewatch the life cycle if you, have, if you haven't understood. Then number two, discuss the pathogenesis of Neglia fowleri. Then number three, write true or false for the following. So let's answer these together. Number one, um, it reads, Neglia fowleri is a pathogenic free-living amoeba. Well, this is a true statement. Then number two, trophozoites are infective stages of Neglia fowleri. That's true because we say they are infective and reproductive stages. Number three, Neglia fowleri is a brain-eating amoeba. This is true. Number four, diagnosis of primary amoebic meningoencephalitis can be determined via cysts found in CSF and gray matter of the brain. We said diagnosis is determined by the trophozoites or the amoeba found in the CSF, not the cyst. So here the keyword is cyst. So this statement is false. Okay. Then number five, transmission of Neglia fowleri is via fecal or a root. Well, this is false because we say transmission is when the amoeba enters through your nasal cavity. So this is where we end our video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and also be notified for our future videos. With that being said, shalom, shalom.